All right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when, when I was a uh, uh, young kid just starting out, um, my, my boss gave me some advice about giving presentations. He said, um, uh, presentation is really a contract between me and you, the audience. Um, my, my job is to, uh, is to uh, inform. Um, your job is to listen and assimilate. And he said, the trick is to make sure that I finish my job before you finish yours. But I'm, but I'm ching. Okay. So, with that falling flat. Hi, my name is Tom Vaden. I work for HPE. I'm a technologist. Um, I work with a number of people in this room, uh, either directly or indirectly, via BZ or Fate or email or a conference call. Uh, some of you I've met before, a few of I haven't. Um, so, for those of you who have worked with me and have just you know, met me, I just want to say I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> uh, I left the evil personality at home. This is the good guy. So, I'm um, going to talk today about uh, HPE persistent memory. Um, uh, you, you folks have been really instrumental in making this work for uh, the community at large and, and certainly on our platforms. So, I want to you know, express some gratitude for that. Um, thanks a lot. Appreciate that. What I'm going to spend some time on today. Um, is talking a little bit, well, maybe more than a little bit, about um, uh, terminology so that uh, uh, when I start talking about use cases, uh, the, the uh, vocabulary will, will make sense as we're kind of going through it. So a uh, little bit of terminology. Uh, for some of you, it's going to be uh, boring because it's a description of how uh, persistent memory appears to a applications to a certain extent. Not, not very deep, but just sort of a broadly, maybe one or two of you, it'll be uh, you know, informative, but for a lot of people, it's going to be boring. So uh, if you check your email on your, your cell phone, I'm not going to be that uh, hurt, trust me. Um, after we, we wade through that, I'm, I want to share some of the data that we've gotten in uh, some of the use cases that we've been able to uh, derive and and uh, prove were uh, you know uh, things that could take advantage of persistent memory, um, and I want to share that with you. Uh, I, I'm not the guy who got all the data together and did all the graphing. There's a, a big team of people who do real work. Uh, one person who would, you know has been really instrumental in this is Scott Norton. I, uh, he's worked with some of you as well. So uh, Scott's not here, but thanks, Scott. Um, <coughs> so with that, let's start. A tour. Um, persistent memory, it's not a panacea. This would imply that uh, it's um, both storage and memory. Um, honestly, I've found out, uh, you know, from my point of view, uh, it acts like storage when you want it to act like memory, and it acts like memory when you want it to act like storage. And so it's never, it's never perfect, but yeah. So, but, you know, there's d definitely good use models. And, uh, I know a number of us have, uh, have come up with them, and I, I think we've got some performance numbers that bear that out. <coughs> so, this is HPE persistent memory. Um, it's uh, based on Intel Optane technology, and it comes in those sizes. And uh, you know, for those of you who don't know about uh, persistent memory, it comes in uh, two major flavors. Um, one is uh, app direct, and that's where persistency is, uh, is provided. And the other one is in memory mode, and that's where it's just big, dumb memory. Uh, and then there's a, a third mix mode, which is a combination of both of those. And there are some you know, potential use cases where that's kind of handy. Um, although, frankly, when you have to worry about configuring mix mode, it makes my head hurt. Um, so for app direct mode, where you have, do have persistency, there are um, a couple of different um, uh, models that, that uh, you want to need to keep in mind. One is uh, storage over app direct, and that's basically uh, the persistent memory shows itself as a storage device, uh, and you treat it as one. So it's a read write kind of device. Uh, the other one is <coughs> what, what we're calling here direct access, and that's byte addressability. Um, and so you're going to bypass uh, read write, and you're just going to do uh, assignments. So Instead of doing read-write, you're doing load-store. So 
uh, that's the two models that uh, app direct persistency uh, comes in. So hopefully that's good. So you'll see me saying, switching back and forth between persistence and app direct. And memory mode is going to mean, you know, volatile, uh, not byte addressable. So memory mode is block. Uh, sorry, memory mode. Sorry, uh, I did it, did it to myself. Memory mode <laughs> is just memory. Nothing, nothing about uh, persistency at all. So sorry about that misstep. So um, this is a really high-level view of uh, how persistent memory uh, app direct mode works. And so as you go from left to right, you get better performance. As you go from left to right, you get more interference in what applications have to do in order to take advantage. So um, in the far left, in the leftmost column, you have uh, the gray arrow, and that's a situation an application doesn't have to do anything at all. There's no configuration change. Um, the uh, persistent memory is just um, mounted as a storage device. And so from the application's point of view, it, it just looks like a very fast SSD. Um, if, um, you know, as you move right, you begin to, to do m things slightly more interesting. Um, you begin to say, well, uh, I can begin to bypass th the page cache, and uh, so that gives me a, a certain step in performance. Um, so you have to do a little bit of something when you configure and mount. Not, not a huge deal, but you have to do something there. Now, when you move from storage over app direct to direct, a direct access, um, that, that's where uh, the application has to begin to get involved. Now, um, for a lot of applications, MMAP is something that they're pretty, pretty used to. So for those applications that do MMAP already, um, that's not really a leap at all. Uh, but for other people who are used to doing you know, read-write type stuff, moving to an MMAP model, it's work. And for some people, it's a big deal. Uh, and then um, you, know, you can begin to take full control of what you've got uh, using you know, your own code or libraries like uh, PMDK um, to, uh, to, to take fuller control of what you want to do. So the application can get very, very uh, intelligent and very, very complicated in how it deals with persistent memory. So as you move to, from left to right, you get more performance. As you move to left to right, you have to do more work. And whether that work is worthwhile uh, really depends on what the application does and the style of uh, you know, what you've got to do. So hopefully that's, that's clear. Uh, at a high level, there, and by the way, there's a lot of quibble room, I know. But at a high level, I'm going to say it. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So in app direct mode, <coughs> uh, what, what, does, uh, what does the system look like? So here, um, I've got a, an example system that's got, you know, that much uh, DRAM and that much uh, persistent memory. And so you can see that um, uh, what's available from a system resource point of view when it's all said and done is 760 gigabytes of, of regular DRAM and then one of a couple of different kinds of configurations for persistent memory. Um, if you have those uh, 12 DIMMs, on two sockets, you've got a choice of interleaving or not interleaving. If you interleave, then um, you're going to get uh, you know, a, a device per socket. If you don't interleave, then you're going to get a device per DIM. And so it's pretty easy. But it's also you know, per socket. You're not going to get um, you know, an interleave across two sockets. So it's socket granularity at, at best, uh, dim, dim granularity at worst, or maybe it's the other way around. Um, so, uh, and this is a, a you know, BIOS configuration, um, so you have to bring up the machine. Uh, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, configuration stuff, but um, you know, generally speaking, configuring uh, persistent memory is a whole another level of complication. Uh, you know, how often do you have to configure your DIMMs? Unless you're on a big machine, you, you play with interleaving, you don't have to. Right. Well, with, with these guys, you've got to worry about you know how it's going to look, targets, uh, interleaving, all kinds of stuff. So there's more complication there that you have to deal with. Um, and uh, I, I, I didn't mention it on the previous slide, but um, uh, and there have been a number of conversations uh, this week talking about file system DACs. 
um, and we'll uh, we'll be we'll be kind of talking about that um, with with some of the the numbers that I've got later. Um, just kind of understand um, if you're uh, the, the regular use with uh, read write paradigm is to go through the page cache and um, DAX allows you to avoid that so you can have direct access to the device itself without any backing store. When you're doing read write and even MMAP with, uh, with, with something you know standard with the file system, you've got a backing store that occasionally has to get flushed to. Uh, with DAX you avoid that so you don't have to do any copying. Uh, you're actually just you know storing or writing directly into the into the uh, the memory so should have spent some time defining that sorry uh, for memory mode um, it, it's important to note uh, that wh what you've got is uh, you know the, the same combination uh, of, of size with this one as the previous frame um, with this combination you've got uh, a certain amount of, of well actually the sizes are different um, you've got a, a certain amount of DRAM and a certain amount of uh, persistent memory. Uh, when you're using it in memory mode, the DRAM disappears and becomes a, uh, a cache for the persistent memory. So um, you, you don't have access to the DRAM at all. It's just magically gone. The, uh, the hardware and the firmware uh, hides it from you. You don't see it. You just see the, uh, the persistent memory range as volatile memory. In the previous slide, uh, that persistent memory shows up as a special type in UEFI and ACPI. Uh, with this, it just shows up as regular volatile memory. And uh, as far as you know, that DRAM doesn't exist because it's, uh, it's cache. And um, the characteristics of how you use this are really dependent on uh, that cache and the size of it. And we'll talk about that more too. So two modes, persistence and memory. Um, so, to the uh, to the the caching effects with uh, with memory mode, um, it, it's it's really really important. Um, you know, it's going to be probably self evident, especially when you start looking at numbers of uh, uh, you know performance. And it's pretty simple, like all caching stuff. If what you're doing fits in the cache, winner. If what you're doing doesn't fit in the cache, loser. And um, that's really about it. Uh, if you have a, an application and you don't size things properly with the cache for, uh, for large volatile memory, it's, you're going you're gonna to see latency issues. Um, and if you do, it's going to be nice. Um, because you know, one, one of the byproducts of, uh, of using uh, uh, Optane is latency with access. The kinds of latencies you see depend heavily on the kind of access you've got. You know, the mixture of read and write, how often you do it. Um, but you, uh, you know that there's going to be latency in accessing uh, actual uh, <coughs> persistent memory. So in the case of memory mode, you really want to minimize that as much as possible. So yes, you want your cache to be hot and work in it. Otherwise, you're going to pay a latency penalty. So. That's pretty self-evident, right? You know, if it's cached, you're good, and if you fit there, you don't. And so, um, part of part of trying to find a, a good situation to be able to use this <coughs> is really finding the application that can, um, you know, either tolerate the latency or live with a, a, a cache of uh, of access that's going to fit within the DRAM size. Self-evident, but you know, it's uh, it's important to say so. So it's, it's sort of like, okay, uh, will my Oracle database perform well with this? And the answer is, of course, it depends. It, you know, are your queries going to fit into a, <coughs> a small thing? Um, are, you know, are your queries going to be uh, totally random? Um, is, it, is it not random but huge? You know, it, it, it totally depends on the, the situation that you're in. And so that's the case here. You know, your mileage may vary. And that, you, you know, pretty much with all of these things, you know, your mileage may vary. As I said before, a lot of useful uh, use cases, but not a panacea. Just to drive it home, on, on the left, good, because it fits in. On the right, bad, because it doesn't. Um, and in fact, there, those are two use cases which um, we've done some measurements with. On the left, um, there's a school district that has a ton of data, historical data with, uh, with students. As it turns out, though, they're only interested in this week. 
maybe today. Um, but they've got terabytes of data that go back to, um, you know, when George Washington was a first grader. And so, so they've got tons and tons, of huge, but their access is so tight um, that actually a very, 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 very tiny DRAM cache nets them exactly the kind of performance they want, which is, um, you know, really fast on the, on the uh, near-term stuff that they need immediately, but pretty good access to that, you know, to, you know, George Washington, Tom Jefferson when they were graduating, you know, what were their grades. So they, they can get to that kind of data pretty well, um, but uh, the hot data they need is really fast. And, you know, from a price point of view, very, very, very happy. Um, on the right, that's uh, a TPC benchmark. Um, and it's like, well, it looks like it ought to fit. It's less than three terabytes. <laughs> But, you know, it's wandering all over the place, and uh, you, can, you can see, you know, the, the number down at the bottom there. You know, it's a big hit in performance because of the, the access times. So, same size database, access can be either really, really good or can get really, really painful. Oops. Um, mixed mode, it's, you know, it, it's both. It's neither fish nor fowl. You have a certain amount of memory. Some of the uh, DRAM is is hidden and totally devoted to backing up the uh, the volatile stuff, and s some of it is visible. And then some of the persistent memory is there. So you you can you can have use cases where it's handy to have a large amount of volatile memory, and you still want some persistency on the side. So this works. It's just a matter of configuring it. From my point of view, um, it, it really is uh, head scratching when you configure it um, when the machine starts up. But if it's good for you. Do it. I am pre uh, yeah, no, the the numbers and, and uh, use cases I've got really don't uh, showcase that much. So, just to drive it home, if you've got a machine that looks like this with that amount of, of uh, DRAM and that amount of persistent memory uh, in AppDirect mode, you have both of them visible with different characteristics. Uh, in the middle, the DRAM disappears so that it's not available in any way, shape, or form. The operating system doesn't see it. There's no way to make it visible. Don't even ask that question, um, if you didn't know that already. Uh, and on the right, you get the mixture. You get some of, uh, some of what's there, and the rest of it's hidden, so you can't use it. So hopefully that sort of explains how things work. If you already knew that, I apologize for boring you to death. If I mis-explain that, please ask now, or when I'm in the talking about things. So. Um, I want to talk about some of the use cases. First, talking about some of the patterns uh, that, um, you know, that, that sort of emerge from use, uh, that emerge use cases that you can use, and then some specifics about use cases that, are, that live there. Um, so, uh, of course, databases, uh, you know, are to, uh, to use a, a fast store instead of uh, SSDs. Uh, it seems like it's a logical thing, and yes, it is. So, um, you know, for the right kind of database with the right kind of characteristic, uh, instead of using uh, NVMe, you've got something that's going to be, uh, you know, potentially consider considerably faster. Um, we'll see some examples, but think about, uh, you know, uh, uh, transaction logs in persistent memory. That's going to be much faster than pushing, pushing uh, transaction action logs out to a disk. And so that's sort of a, a no-brainer is one of the good possibilities. Um, in in an, another situation where you might have a database that's got multiple tiers of, uh, of uh, data that they've got, um, uh, there's a, I think the SAP people, when they described what they were doing with a persistent memory, basically described this characteristic. So you've got um, the most, the hottest data is in DRAM, uh, the not so hot, but still pretty darn hot uh, data, uh, I believe our, in HANA it's called a, a Delta store. Um, that, that's where you, uh, you want some persistent memory to be able to, to live so that when, you know, uh, if you have to do a restart or the machine dies, you can come back up with that. Um, SQL does the same kind of thing in SQL 19 for some of the hot, warm, uh, cold memory as well. Um, and so that's another database use case where you've got some tiering going on for um, their storage. Uh, fast database restart uh, for, uh, you know, SAP HANA is a really good uh, use case there. And then uh, for uh, some uh, database stuff, uh, you know, Spark, for instance, 
uh, that can take advantage of some uh, persistent tiering sort of effectively, um, you know, where they've got some hot stuff that needs to be, uh, you know, saved and persisted. They're able to use persistent memory. You know, it's, it's small enough and compact enough so that it fits really nicely. So they can, they can actually use a, a small persistent memory thing to be able to do that. So just sort of those kinds of use cases are things that we've, uh, you know, explored. For the uh, large memory mode, non-persistent use cases, um, we've we found a couple of places where it, uh, you know, it's, it's really, you know, pretty useful. Um, even in the case of, uh, you know, it may not all fit very nicely kind of in the, the uh, persistent, uh, sorry, in the DRAM cache. Um, in the virtualization situation where you really kind of want to overcommit, but you want to overcommit to something a little faster than a disk, um, then you can, persistent memory is a, is a reasonable capability there. So that, um, you know, your, your performance expectations aren't intense, uh, but the ability to get something reasonably um, with a lot of virtual ma machines uh, is there. I mean, you don't want to you don't want to take forever, but you don't really need instantaneous response. Um, and you can do that and and build something at much lower cost. And then again, where uh, you've got uh, you know a a situation where performance um, you know isn't necessarily uh, you know, super critical, but you still need a lot of memory. And there are situations where, you know, not everything is necessarily performance critical. Um, you can fit something that would have taken a four socket server with, uh, with non-persistent memory, a uh, regular memory, uh, well, non-persistent, non, um, yeah, non-optane memory. Um, you can now fit that amount of uh, information in a two socket server. And so uh, th this could be really handy because a lot of licensing is per socket or per core, right? And so if you can do the same size database with, with two sockets worth of processing power, then, you know, you can have a pretty big savings. Again, your, if your performance expectations are very high, that's probably, that's not going to work. But if, um, if uh, you know, that situation is good for you, then, you know, it's a, it's a cost saver. Um, there's one, uh, you know, particular... Um, SQL use case that I want to look at uh, to kind of show, uh, you know, a, a pretty reasonable, uh, you know, positive for, uh, for persistent memory. This course is uh, uh, SQL on Linux, um, just to make sure that everybody knows that. Um, this is the situation. It's um, uh, a, 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 well, rack, rack space, um, you know, help provide some of the data. So it's a sort of a stand-up rack space thing. Um, it's, a, it's a little skinny uh, because I, I think the preference would probably be to have more than, you know, one disk. But um, for the sake of measurement, uh, it was built this way. Uh, with the results, even if you had multiple disks, um, the, 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 well, multiple disks, you would be rating. This isn't rated because we were trying to do some measurements. Um, uh, we still think that uh, um, the uh, the performance data would be um, you know still pretty positive. So um, anyway, it, it's it's pretty close to a real life situation. Um, so I've got a few graphs to sort of show we can uh, you know kind of look at that baseline is with just a regular um, uh, disk. Um, uh, then you've got um, uh, PMEM in memory mode. Then you've got uh, NVMe with, so you've got, in, in, you know, at first it's eight, uh, hard disk, then um, uh, PMEM with memory mode with a hard disk back there, NVMe, NVMe with uh, memory mode, and then just memory mode. So the, uh, the, the, the far right is no disks at all, just memory mode, and so you can, um, you know, basically see there's a, a pretty positive trend as you get away, uh, you know, as you get closer to the right. Um, maybe not startling, uh, especially as, uh, as things get larger, but still, you know, you can see that there's an advantage there. Okay. Um, now, if you, in, if you don't, all right, so that was the read case, right? So, um, in the read-write case, you can see things beginning to get more interesting, where um, you know you're you're really having to do 
I.O. Uh, to get something pushed out, you can begin to see that, oh, this is pretty nice because, um, you know, when, when uh, you've got enough memory not to have to do I.O., then it begins to get uh, much more interesting. So you could even say, well, um, you know, if I needed to do multiple disks, uh, things would probably get you know, more throughput, so that leftmost line would go up a little bit. It's not going to go up all the way as the rightmost line. So this is a pretty uh, good demonstration of a case that uh, works pretty well. And then when you get to the, the right case, it's even more pronounced. So that you can see, uh, yep, not having to do I.O. makes a difference. So again, it's pretty self-evident, but um, you know, here's good proof. All right, um, so I want to uh, take a, a look at a few different use cases, and you can kind of see for the configuration use case we've got um, some of the advantages that you know, can be gained. All right, mentioned um, uh, the, uh, the VM use case. Now, I apologize, this is a VMware slide, but we uh, totally, completely believe that KVM uh, can do that. Unfortunately, we don't have a staff big enough to do everything all at once. So, um, uh, this is the the use case I talked about, where you know, in, in a, if you instead of having a disk for a lot of VMs, if you've got a large amount of uh, persistent memory and memory mode backing things up, um, you can have a bajillion VMs and uh, and do pretty darn well. Um, so, if you uh, if you uh, you know, in here we're using. Um, uh, Microsoft uh, SQL again uh, to sort of push things around. And so you can see that um, you know, the, the percentage of, uh, of, of goodness begins to get you know, really kind of interesting. And the numbers there show that uh, there's some worthwhileness in a configuration like this. And this is a legitimate configuration. Assuming um, you, know, you're, uh, you, you don't have some, I mean, there are extremes where it won't be good enough. But in general, you've got a fair amount of performance with a number of, uh, of VMs and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, less cost, too. So, you know, you, you, get, you get all those goodies, but with only a 2% ding with performance. So, not bad. Um, here's a, an Oracle situation uh, where... Uh, You've got the, the case of uh, replacing a four-socket server with a two-socket server. And so, um, you know, in, in the uh, HP speak, Synergy 660 is a four-socket uh, blade system, and uh, 480 is a two-socket system. So you can see here, basically, not a whole lot of difference. But um, if you notice, um, you know, it might be a, a little bit of a licensing cost difference with Oracle. So. And from a performance point of view, it's not so bad. You know, you just lose a little bit and you're able to get it. Now, you, you could certainly have situations where uh, access um, you know, may not be as sweet as this, but um, there are a number of, uh, of, of access patterns that would promote this pretty well. So again, you know, if things are right, this could be a big win for, uh, for customers. Uh, here's a case of, uh, of Oracle with a redo log, so that you can um, uh, begin to see uh, how things uh, can work with persistent memory as well. Um, the, uh, well, okay, so you can see the, uh, the, the different, uh, you know, things that we measured uh, without, um, with uh, persistent memory, um, with and without redundancy for the redo log, um, you know. If you, if you need redundancy, some people do that, some people don't. It, it all depends on you know, your, uh, your situation. But you can see that um, the, uh, the amount of being able to provide a device you know, that, that uh, you know, does this um, with uh, a significant amount of gain um, you know, is, is worth it. So again, it, it wouldn't have to be a very big piece of persistent memory, uh, but um, you know, it can make a real difference. So again, that's an app direct persistent. Uh, and and here, here's an interesting one with Spark, where we've got um, you know, a, uh, a, a 
uh, spark cache that's going into persistent memory um, and being able to be local and, uh, and fit into it. And so you can see um, a big performance difference here. And so there, there are a number of, uh, of database possibilities where you know, I, I need a small, local, persistent tier to be able to write into. Um, and th this, this use case can be very, very advantageous. Um, uh, th this is this is a really interesting one as well um, that uh, that shows uh, you know a Cloudera use case. Um, again, you're uh, you're uh, you know uh, fitting into um, a, a, a reasonable size and able to get some really good performance. The numbers kind of speak for themselves, really, you know, 48%. And then um, uh, earlier in the week, we've had, well, during the week, we've had a number of conversations that talk about SAP and their use for persistent memory. Uh, this is their restart case that, uh, that we've been able to, uh, to show as well. Um, and so the, uh, the restart time is um, blindingly fast, which is good. So if you're doing database restarts, for whatever reason, um, th this is really really helpful. If you have a system outage, then you get uh, you know some real bonuses for for being able to uh, to come up really fast. So, you know, if you have to do system maintenance, this helps keep your outage window uh, really really pretty low. Um, it's a very small trade-off for performance uh, to be able to you know have that kind of capability to uh, to save time. So. Um, Let's see. I, I've got one demo that I want to end up with, but before I before I get there, I want to you know just sort of go through some of the uh, the observations about uh, persistent memory. Um, there there are a number of, of good use cases that are uh, you know useful and important for customers to be able to use, um, but uh, it's it's not a panacea. Not every workload will necessarily, uh, you know, show a positive behavior, um, and so the, the the bottom line really is, um, you know, careful analysis of what the application is doing, and the situation it's being used in is really key to being un understand to understand uh, where and what configurations for persistent memory will be useful. Um, I. Uh, kind of, you know, I've driven it home probably real hard about the cache on per, on memory mode. Um, but when it comes to uh, dealing with persistent memory, there are some issues, uh, you know, it, it really is different. And so there's uh, a non-trivial amount of configuration that, uh, 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 considerations that you have to go through. Um, and it's, it's, you don't just buy a ton of it and put it in. You have to really uh, consider how many, uh, you know, how many, the, the, the uh, ratio of, of uh, persistent memory to DRAM you have to worry about where things are plugged in. Um, you have to worry about how you configure it, um, whether you, uh, uh, um, yeah, yeah in, in a number of RBSU things, whether um, uh, you, um, you know, have it, um, well, yeah. So anyway, it, it's complicated. And um, so there's a number of things you have to worry about at configuration time that you really didn't have to worry about otherwise. Now the payoffs, as some of those numbers showed you, are really you know worth it. But just beware that um, you know it's something you have to think about ahead of time. What what's the fit for my application? Uh, what kind of you know what's the best configuration for it? Um, you know sizing and so on to make sure that you uh, you know buy appropriately. Um, and then you know for uh, you ha you do have to worry about platform uh, failures. Uh, don't forget, in memory mode, it's not persistent, so that's you know, that that goes away. That's normal. Um, with app direct mode, those DIMMs are on the machine, and so uh, you know that data is captive, and you have to sort of be aware of that's the case. Um, you know, with with SAP, for instance, uh, there's uh, you know disk backup to make sure that you know the data isn't uh, totally captive, um, but for other folks, you have to work that into your plans. And th there are ways to deal with that. So, you know, you can move DIMMs if a machine is really dead. 
Um, and so it's definitely possible, but it's something you have to keep in mind. Um, we've done a, a number of reference architectures for the kinds of uh, situations that I went through with the numbers before. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that I think people need. So those are use cases. People can see that's the pattern that I've got. Uh, so that's the kind of configuration that I'm going to need and the kind of stuff that I have to do. Um, just to show uh, you know, um, some of the things you have to worry about as far as uh, you know, memory is, uh, configuration is concerned, for, uh, for BIOS configuration on HPE servers, you have to worry about uh, a number of things that uh, you have to set before the machine comes up for um, you know, the, the, the kinds of uh, you know, how much DRAM you want to devote to memory mode, um, uh, how much uh, uh, you know, the, the sizing, and uh, a number of other things that you have to worry about that you don't have to with, uh, with regular memory. And um, you, you also have to uh, you know, do some special things with the persistent stuff providing namespaces so that uh, you've got um, you know, devices that will show up in the, uh, in the file system space for, for you to be able to use. And uh, so there's configuration things that you do have to worry about here. You just have to be aware that you know, it's a few more steps and you have to deal with it. All right. Oops, OK. Now. Um, and I've got uh, a few other things that uh, show uh, that are pointers to uh, some of the information that I had. There are a number of demos that kind of show things and, uh, you know, collateral for, for uh, stuff. So, you know, I, I, I point this out because, you know, for a lot of people it's going to be how do I use this. Um, so if you've got a pattern in mind, there's some good information for you to be able to look at to see if, um, you know, what you're thinking about would, would be sustainable. Uh, so, I'm going to go back to this. Um, all right, so I've got a, a real quick uh, video that uh, shows um, Microsoft SQL on, on Linux. Um, and a number of you here have, uh, have worked in that kind of environment, yes? Um, uh, uh, Microsoft SQL 2019 has uh, um, made a number of changes to take advantage of persistent memory uh, in AppDirect mode. Um, like, like most of the database vendors, uh, it started as a journey of storage over AppDirect. It's sort of like, hi, you know, you can almost write a script. Um, your, uh, your log file, just put it on there. And then, you know, it may, you know after a while, uh, database people begin to think about, well, I've got this thing, if I could do, yeah. And, and over time, um, it, it, it kind of works like that. But basically, with persistent memory, that's how it's been. Um, gosh, seems like a good idea. How do we use it? Don't know. Over time, people have figured out more and more. Um, I think our friends at Microsoft have done a really, really good job of making that progress over time. Um, starting out with, let's just replace uh, storage for the tail of the log uh, to something that's um, much more um, fine-grained in how it's used. Um, so for Microsoft SQL, there are a couple of, of things that, um, uh, you know, that are highlighted here. Um, using, uh, you know, uh, where they need persistence with uh, pieces of the database, putting it on um, byte addressable storage in DAX mode. And um, then there's something they've got that's the hybrid buffer pool. Um, pre this, um, buffer pool pointers involved going out to disk. Uh, post this. Buffer pool goes directly to uh, persistent memory. So, um, uh, a number of things that have made this, you know, 2019 uh, much, much better. Now, what I'm going to show you is this is a work in progress. There's um, still work that's going on with Microsoft, with Microsoft SQL to take advantage of persistent memory. So, the results you see are, you know, are going to be improved. So th this was the slide that it's both a dessert topping and a floor wax. It's 
still the okay. And then, yeah, you know this already too. And then uh, this this is this is um, I think just a, a sort of snapshot of what I talked about before. Uh, 2019 changes to be able to uh, to take more advantage of uh, persistent memory. Log file enlightenment means taking advantage of persistent memory, and the hybrid buffer pool is uh, is a pretty big deal. The fourth one really doesn't have anything to do with persistent memory. So, what what we built here was uh, a diskless server. Um, the server here, uh, the, there there are disks, but it's just to boot and to back up when when backup is necessary. So um, uh, you can see that uh, pre, pre and post, um, because there are no disks, there's a reduction in rack space, there's a reduction in power consumption, and the concomitant energy savings as well. So this is a really good use case. All right, so this is a description of the, uh, the data warehouse for the, um, there's three different kinds of uh, runs that, are, that I'll show here so you can see the data. Uh, the 2017 SSD-based system and the 2019 PMIM-based system, so you can see no disks. And again, it's 2019 pre, uh, you know, um, pre-production bits. So uh, this is a case where we're, um, you know, running the queries um, with drop clean buffers. That means that we're we're making it cold every single time we uh, we go through. So this is a a cold query throughout. And so just note, um, lower is better. On the left, you've got um, Microsoft 2017 on Gen 10 with disks, and on the right, it's 2019 with no disks. One other thing to note is that, um, you know, in order to be able to handle the same load, look at the memory consumption uh, on the left and on the right. So again, cold queries. Blue is old, green is new. So um, even with pre-production bits, you can see that uh, you know, the diskless server is you know, either equivalent or better uh, pretty much, well, not pretty much, across the board. And so uh, you can see the differences in, uh, you know, clearer here with percentages. So that these, these query types are, you know, demonstrably either better or as good. Next one, okay, th this is um, where we start cold and then we get warm over time. And again, point out memory consumption, but lower is better. Green is new, blue is old. And so, again, you can see the kinds of things that Microsoft has done to take advantage of um, persistent memory in app direct mode um, are, uh, are paying off. Again, you start, start cold to get warm. So you can see uh, you know, the differences in uh, what we've got here. Again, universally better in some cases really a lot better, in some cases a little. But again, these are early bits and the, uh, you know, the expectation is uh, you know, for them to improve. Uh, finally, uh, it, it's, it's warm, it starts warm, and so it's warm throughout. So again, lower is better. Blue is 2017, green is 2019. 
And yes, here's, here's one case where uh, the pre-release bits aren't quite as good, but uh, that they, they understand what that is and that's gonna be, you know, that's some of the stuff that they're working on. So, um, the, the point is, uh, you know, for those folks who are sort of going along the journey of using persistent memory with databases, um, you know, th it's a pattern that they can kind of follow. Uh, let's start with storage over AppDirect, then let's begin to pick apart the things that would make sense for us to be able to use for tail of the log, and then, and then um, you know, more of a, what can, what, what things can I put in a persistent, um, oh, we don't need to, we don't need to watch it now. What, what sort of things can I put into uh, you know, persistent storage uh, as I understand the application more and more? Um, so the, 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 the promise of persistent memory still is something that's, that's being developed. And uh, as applications get more used to it, then they're going to be understanding um, you know, where it can be more useful. Classic databases stuff, in some ways, is kind of easy. When you start thinking of, uh, of, of newer file systems, newer databases that are uh, you know, more of a... Uh, you know, not a monolith, uh, it's going to be kind of interesting to figure out where persistence can matter. And uh, so people who are right, who understand their applications will understand where they can apply this. Um, not necessarily a magical, you know, just plug it in and it all works. So um, <coughs> that, that's really it. Um, you know, there's, uh, there are a number of good use cases that show that this is uh, a useful technology for people to use. Um, it's important to understand that your mileage may vary and that uh, an application use um, needs to be carefully determined. Um, you know, is it Oracle? Yes. Well, what kind of access is it going to be? Well, if it's one thing, it's going to be this way. If it's another, it's not. So just being aware that uh, application and application use <coughs> are going to determine how healthy and how useful it is. So it's good. Just think about how you're going to use it. So hopefully that was uh, quasi useful in understanding some of the use cases that might work out. And you know, any questions? Craig, I have, I have a question. Yeah, I'll, I'll be your straight man here. Okay. Actually, this is a real question. This is this is great here. Um, I, I don't know this. I don't know this guy. I've never seen <laughs> yeah, in my life. Pretend like we don't know each other. So, is, do we have any guidance on how to populate a board? with persistent memory. It would be my luck that all of my threads would be on this CPU socket that had to talk to the other CPU to get persistent memory stuff. So, so do we so interleave or? The, the, uh, the, the reference architectures help you with that. Okay, so and, there's and some guidance there as to NUMA yes. domains and all of that y yes. stuff. Yes, yeah. Okay. Reference architectures for this kind of stuff are critically important. They, they really are. There's no sort of, here's the formula. It really is, you know, what, what's my application, what's, what's its, its access, um, what, what's it going to do? And then, you know, where you populate, how many of which, where. Yeah, the, the uh, reference architectures help with that, and that's a, that's a good question. That's why the reference architectures are so important. Um, you, you really can't just encapsulate a bunch of, a bunch of rules and say, have at it. it. It really needs to be, this is a pattern that worked, this is the configuration that we used, and so, you know, you can get some benefit as well. Oh, I don't know this guy either. Okay, uh, thanks, Tom. Oh, oh, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a question here. Like, uh, uh, for this uh, persistent uh, memory here, what kind of interface it is used? Uh, what, what kind of what? Interface. It's uh, DIMM or PCIe? Uh, 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 th this is just in a DIMM slot. So, what kind of I/O devices left in this you, in this you, server? You, you don't you don't see I/O when it's talking to the memory. It's just memory. Okay. Just then memory. comes to my final question. Like, uh, so about the operating system, like uh, here. Yeah. Hold on one second. Let me go up uh, to a picture, which might be useful. Uh -huh. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Uh, about the, uh, are you still using the normal kernel, normal Linux distribution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, there, there's a lot of I/O stuff there. So do you think? Uh, uh, but but it's it, I, yeah, no, it, it it on on the you know w when you when you get over here, you're mm -hmm. totally bypassing the I/O that you know on the on the left, you're you're in the file system with the stuff that the file system does, assuming read-write kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. But not, you're really not doing any I.O. in any of this. 
Uh, um. I, no, but there, there's I.O. like uh, the, the code in the normal kernel there. Yeah. So do you think uh, like uh, to remove the, or find another way to optimize this, this thing? Well, th that's, that's, okay. So in, 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 in this case, the, from application to kernel is doing read-write, you know, because that, that's file system norm normalcy. Um, but below read-write, even though you're going through file system code, you're not doing I.O. at all. So you're bypassing I.O. there. Uh, as you move from the left to the right, what you're doing is taking more and more of the infrastructure out of the way so that, you know, you, you move over and you're avoiding the page cache. You move over, you're not even doing read-write anymore. You're using mmap to be able to do load store. Okay. And then even further over, you're taking even more of the infrastructure on your own. Okay. But there's, there's, there's... Sorry, there's, sorry, there's, there's one more question. One yeah, there, more question. There, there, there's, there's no I.O. It's just, I you know, I, I, I do read-write because that's uh, the pattern I know. Do, do you have a user case for multiple nodes there? Um, multiple nodes? Yeah, like uh, you bounce over uh, the, the, like the, hundred, the, thousand, uh, the, this kind of server there. The, How the, do you... The, 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 all right, so um, multiple nodes worrying about... Um, persistent memory is going to require something like RDMA in order to be able to get to it because mm. that NVDIM is on that system. It's not shared. It's not fabric. There's no way to attach to it from any place else. But uh, do, do you have a plan to do that? or To, uh, to attach uh, persistent memory? Uh, mod, mod, yeah. Um, so um, there are future technologies for fabric uh, attached devices. Uh, one of them is called Gen Z. Uh, <laughs> the machine. <laughs> the machine. That, uh, yeah. that, that I actually have a presentation here for. We could go into that if you want to. Okay. Um, but uh, the, the, the real problem is you know, these devices are on the DIM bus. Okay. And so they're, they are uh, captive to the server that they're on. And uh, so the only way to be able to share them is through mechanisms that you would expect, like RDMA. Uh -huh. um, and and that's that's a, a reasonable pattern for this. And there's a lot of work that's gone on in the kernel to make that, uh, you know, a, a reasonably productive way to handle things. So okay. RDMA is, is is kind of for for these things, it's kind of the way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's amazing for a local node there. I, I mean, it would be much more amazing if we have a cluster of this kind of machine to work yes. together. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I'm, I'm I'm with you on that. I got, I got the Gen Z presentation here. here. And yeah. Yeah. And, and um, you know, f for, for more localized stuff with fabrics, um, you know, CXL will probably help too. So yeah, I don't have a CXL presentation, but I can talk about it later. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Right. Um, we found, due to our testings, that unfortunately DIMs carry locality information. So you cannot easily just exchange them. You which you poses some supportability questions. Yes. Namely, if one of my DIMs go bad, well, if I have to exchange this, I have what to do redo I do? my entire memory pool. Well, if, if, if for instance, um, and for instance, if you, if you have interleaving and mm. one DIM goes bad, yeah, what, what do you so do? Th there, are, there, are, there are things that you can do to, um, to uh, insulate your, yourself mm. to a certain extent to be able to do, take care of the failure cases. Mm. So. Yeah. You, you, can, you can work around that. But, but the problem is, those DIMs are in a server, and there are consequences to that that you kind of have to deal with. Okay, so and you know, s swapping them out willy-nilly is, is not going to work. Can you arrange things so that swapping them, putting them in the new machine will work? Y yes, you can. But you have, to, you have to think about what you're doing and how you configure yeah. things. So basically, a best practice document really would be helpful. Yes, the reference architectures try to help you get through that kind of thing. You know, it's, where do you plug them in? How do you configure them for being able to handle things as best you can? It's, you know, it's not just plugging a DIM in. There's a bunch of things that have to go along with this, which includes, you know, thinking about things like that as well as configuring things properly. You know, are they useful? Yes, they are. Do you have to really put some thought in how you're going to use them? Yes, you do. Reference architectures are a good way for you to see. That's my pattern. I see that I can use that. If, if you're blazing trails, um, that, that's real effort. That's real effort. I, I'm really a lazy guy. I like other people showing me what they've done. You know, that's why I like the open community. I can just, you know, plagiarize and lift other people's work as right and left. So, but, but this is a case where look at the reference architectures 
you can, you can, you can subcase off of those. Okay. But f those patterns are precious so that you can know what to do. I mean, ha how many, you know, there are a number of folks here who, you know, played with NVDIMs without kind of reference architectures. Yeah, how do you figure out, you know, percentage, uh, you know, ratios and where painfully, they go? Painfully, Yeah, and, and so for, 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 for that understanding, that's really critical for people to be able to, you know, build m machines for the application that they got, so. Okay, thank you. Good question. So this is kind of a follow-on to what Hannes was just talking about. Since you have to configure this up front in the BIOS, yeah. does that mean the BIOS takes care of, oh, I noticed that you have it in this configuration? Can I inherit it or can I delete it? So if it's persistent memory, you know, like AppDirect, there's stuff configured on it, I can erase it? Okay, so. And, and the opposite, of course. Yes, you can cleanse them um, as, as you need to. So being able to do that is, uh, because you don't want data just lying around. It, it needs to be able to go away when you need it to. So yes, there's, there's ways to do that. Hello, yes. Tom. Yeah. yeah. Is there any use cases that for Kubernetes world like to enable the persistent memory in Kubernetes to allocate containers to take the advantage of this? Y yes, as in, you know, I, I, I've got, I've got a, a worker node that's got certain attributes, which includes yeah. persistent memory. Um, so, so the answer is, is kind of yes. I mean, it really just looks kind of like storage. And so it's a special class of storage that you can show up there. But you know, has there been a lot of work done in, in that regard? I don't know of, of tons. But, but it, it's, it, I, I don't think there's a whole lot of heavy lift for it as a regular storage device. Um, uh, for, for other attributes to show up, uh, I, I think that would be interesting to uh, you know, to, uh, to prove out over time. I mean, I, I think it's a good question. Okay, thank if it's you. just storage, I think we're okay. If you're, you know, if you're trying to do something more exotic with it for AppDirect, um, th that I think is, gosh, how would we want to use that? Um, and and there, there are a number of possibilities that it, it could, become it could become interesting in, in a, uh, a container environment too. You know, maybe, maybe that's where you keep revs of something, uh, you know, to make it easier. Maybe that's how you cache Images, yeah. uh, you know. Th there's, I, I think you can probably go wild with the possibilities of how to use it in an environment like that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, image caching is yeah, yeah, for uh, for containers. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned VMware. And sorry if I misunderstood something, but uh, what what is the current state for uh, KVM? Uh, KVM is is you know wonderful. It knows how to. Uh, you know, use them, pass them up. Um, you know, th th as, as far as this was concerned, it really is a, a you know, replacing uh, overcommitment of disk to, in a sense, um, uh, persistent memory so that you effectively have a faster disk. So it's the same deal with, uh, with uh, KVM. You, you can overcommit and have a, a, a lot more VMs um, at your disposal than you would at a, at a reasonable speed, so, yeah. It's the, the the KVM pattern for this is identical to the to the VMware one, so you, you could I I could you know edit the slide and say KVM, it, it'd be a lie because I don't have the numbers for it, but it would it would be exactly the same thing. Yeah, so I, I did apologize for VMware, but you know K, KVM is going to act and behave and be happy in the same way. Really, it, it will. And as far as facility is concerned, you know the. Virtualization is, it's there. Any other questions? Okay, then I'm, I'm gonna s say that we're done. If you have any questions, you can, you know, get to me. <laughs>